This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. You know, a lot of the conversations that we have on this show follow the news cycle, so to speak. We're keeping an eye on stories as they develop, stories that matter to Canadians. And then we talk to the top experts to better understand how those stories should land with us. We want the informed expert perspectives on subjects, on stories, on incidents that impact Canadians. We want you to feel like you're the most informed of anybody in your family, of anybody in your friend circle, so that when you are talking about issues that matter with people, you're doing it from an informed base. You're doing it from a position where you've sought to understand and you've participated in a community, this talk show that makes a commitment to doing exactly that. Well, today is one of those days. Today is one of those episodes. We're not necessarily following the news cycle per se, but we're focusing, or at least our jumping off point, is a story that I think the majority of Canadians are either casually or intensely paying attention to. And that is the five former World Junior Canada hockey players, the Team Canada players from 2018 that are facing very serious charges following an alleged group sexual assault uh, as that team celebrated its gold medal win. The incident alleged to have occurred in June of 2018. In just a second, we're going to talk to an expert on masculinity. In fact, he's made this his career work, studying masculinity in school, sports, and beyond. And I'm looking forward to the insights that we're going to glean um, from Dr. Michael Keeler coming up in just a little bit. The second half of the show is going to be a little bit lighter in the subject matter category and something I think we can all get behind, and that's focusing on birds and the value that birds bring to the ecosystem. Once a year, the team at the Nature Conservancy of Canada invites people to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. I love this. It's an assignment for Canadians and thousands of people participate, some of them for 10, 15 minutes, some of them all weekend long, and they log, they record, the birds that they see touch down in their yard. It helps the Nature Conservancy of Canada better understand what bird populations look like across the country. You may, you may say, well, why does this matter? We're about to find out in the second half of this episode, which is happening, by the way, uh, thanks to the support of this episode's presenting sponsor, which is the team at Rello. This is a obviously uh, a big time of year for people that are dreaming about starting a new career. Right? You get the folks that when they turn over that calendar to a new year, they say, I'm done. I'm done with being stuck in a cubicle. I'm done with working for a team that doesn't appreciate me. If you're dreaming or even committed to leaving cubicle life behind, a career in real estate could be your perfect match. You can get started today by enrolling with Rello. It's Alberta's top real estate school. They want to support you every step of the way. From studying for your exam to getting your license and beyond, plus the best part about Rello, or one of the best parts anyway, is that all of your studies are 100% online, which means they're going to align with your schedule no matter what. Right now, there's a great offer for real talkers because you're hearing about this on this show, you're automatically going to save 20% off any Rello course. You've just got to use the promo code REALTALK. That's all one word, REALTALK, when you get started today at Rello.ca. Everybody in Canada, it seems, is paying attention to the former World Junior Hockey players. Four of them had been playing in the National Hockey League up until a short time ago when they took leave to report to police in London, Ontario, to be charged with sexual assault. Michael Keeler is a research chair of masculinity studies at the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. Uh, Michael was once a high school teacher, but he now considers youth and specifically uh, studies on boys and men, uh, his life's work, the way that young men in particular act and learn about masculinity in schools, in sport, and beyond. His ongoing research addresses boys and men as allies and advocates to challenge sexism, homophobia, and violence. You may have seen some of his recent research. It's been published and reported on nationally. Uh, where He addressed boys' experiences during the pandemic and their struggles of silence and loneliness as teenage boys. Uh, Dr. Michael Keeler joining us on this episode of Real Talk. Thank you for making time for us, doctor. It's nice to see you. 
Pleasure being here. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. How, do, how does a guy like you wind up in a field like this? You don't hear of a lot of people, uh, research chairs in masculinities studies, kind of a unique field. It's, uh, yeah, it's fairly unique and definitely uh, here in um, North America. Uh, this is the only uh, research chair of masculinity studies in education. So, uh, you know, I, I came uh, here through being a high school teacher and eventually started, you know, really thinking about the sort of the models of masculinity around us and how that uh, played itself out in schools. And I, I looked around myself as a, both as a student, but as a teacher and, and looked at who were the other representations of men that I was surrounded by. And um, that, that sort of led me to my uh, earlier research in terms of where are the rest of the boys, because we hear a lot about very popular boys, the ones who are in the center of the classroom, the ones who dominate classroom spaces. And that then led me to uh, sort of look a little further out uh, from those boys that uh, tend to get all the focus. Hmm. Um, I'd be curious for your definition of masculinity. Uh, we hear it applied as an adjective most often. I think uh, a fashion design might be perceived to be very masculine. Uh, the scent of a cologne, very masculine. Somebody comes across as very masculine. And as I'm using the word, people's imaginations are, are probably recalling examples in their own personal lives of who that is that smells masculine in their life or who comes across as acting very masculine. But how do you describe it? That's, uh, that's a good good point and a good starting point, too. I, I think when we think about masculinity, um, even the sort of definition of it has changed from you know what we historically have thought about as a biological um, sort of assumption that all men are naturally aggressive, all men are naturally leaders and dominant. And, and there was this assumption that was very much um, just the way boys and men are because of their biology. Uh, as, as we've evolved in our research and understandings have evolved, we actually are paying a lot of attention to how uh, culture uh, how our um, you know daily context uh, contributes to how we define masculinity and what we value in terms of expressions of masculinity. So if you think about uh, in uh, locker rooms or in boardrooms or in school spaces, we we other people in authority um, try to promote and encourage certain ways of being boys and and what we find currently is is this tension between what we assumed uh was masculine uh based on this biological kind of idea that you know because of their chromosomes they they act that way they they don't have any feelings or they can't express express those feelings and so we've shifted from that assumption and those expectations to actually acknowledging the kind of impact that we have on promoting uh, certain ways of being boys so we, we look more closely now at uh, different um, masculinized spaces where uh, boys gather or men gather, uh, you know, think about football games most recently, or think about um, sporty spaces and um, the ways that some boys are very sporty boys. And um, so again, I think in terms of what is masculinity, it is what we make it to be and a North American sort of cultural understanding is very much you know, um, centered around images that we get routinely given to us through the media, through advertising, and and it's upheld again in um, these sporty spaces where um, oftentimes parents or coaches promote and they they um, expect boys to banter back and forth and and they expect a certain kind of banter and um it's rarely one that's caring and supportive and it's more often one that centers on the belittling of other boys or so this um 
attempt to assert themselves as the leader and and the popular boy. So so that's how you know I would define masculinity. It's more centered on what kinds of expressions, what kind of attitudes or behaviors do we promote in different contexts? Is the enemy of your work uh, that the phrase that that is often trotted out sometimes by adoring parents? who are having a good laugh at two six-year-olds who come in covered in mud and with skinned knees and making a mess in the boot room, but in some cases is used to explain away bad or even criminal behavior, that phrase, of course, being boys being boys. Is that phrase the enemy or the crux or the intersection or the platform, the foundation of your work? Uh, uh, Ryan, I mean... Not so much the enemy. It, it is, I think, a reflection on attitudes. And it's a reflection on how we so easily dismiss some of these behaviors of, of youth and just say, well, that's just the way it is. And um, oftentimes, in that case, you know, parents may throw up their hands and say, well, they're just boys being boys. And, and they don't reconsider the kind of impact they can have to to also allow boys to be different than what we think is very normal um, and natural ways of being boys. So rather than expanding the idea of how those boys can play together and support one another, um, many, many will just say, Boys will be boys, and uh, leave it at that. And and that's where you know, again my research sort of centers on what choices are we making to promote uh, forms of aggression, for example, and and how does that then uh, go down a path where uh, we see you know boys really trying to assert dominance over others, and again as I mentioned earlier always at the expense of others mm. people who may not appear as manly as them you'll notice that like we, we've not yet touched on the, this high profile and very disturbing story uh you know where it's alleged that five members of of what one of the teams that canada has taken great pride in over the last number of years the 2018 world junior team the gold medal winning team uh, are charged with some pretty horrific uh offenses and that's intentional because i I want to lay the groundwork for this first, for this conversation. I, I don't want to just bring you on here and, and tap into your expertise specifically about this story. We'll get there in a second. But I, on this show, like to get ahead of where the critics are at. And I'm sure that you've had your fair share of critics and, and naysayers and, and people who would love to disparage or dismiss your work. And, and I would imagine that the, the recurring theme of that would be, oh, here's a guy that's going to turn the next generation of boys soft we're going to be we're, we're going to be we're going to be raising a generation of sissies uh kids young boys are going to forget how to be men what do you say to the critics uh, um ryan i mean it's, it's spot on in terms of uh, those who might consider dismissing my research and might consider um you know trying to say you know this is at the cost of other men. And in fact, what my research shows is that um, what I'm showing is that there's actually a diversity of masculinities. And I'm not discounting or um, saying that uh, boys who, you know, are traditionally very sporty are, um, are necessarily bad in any way. And uh, what I am saying is that we need to acknowledge the kind of way that we, we as adults oftentimes, and uh, authorities, the way that we influence and contribute to what we validate or valorize as masculinity. And so um, it doesn't always have to come at the cost of others as well and and you don't always lose something when when you think about um broadening our our understanding of what it means to be a boy or a man you have to acknowledge you can actually gain you can actually grow um 
as a boy, as a man, to have healthier relationships, to, to be able to express yourself and not feel like you have to suppress, for example, um, emotions or fears. Uh, we all know how that relates to mental health, to high rates of suicide among men. And so rather than look at softening or um, losing something as men, we might want to consider how this actually expands and grows masculinity in healthy and more productive ways, rather than um, going to this sort of deficit idea that we lose something and I'm softening them as though it as though that's a negative thing. It can actually be a very positive way to promote, you know, a much um, healthier lifestyle and much longer lifestyle. If you're just tuning in, uh, maybe listening live on the Mixler audio app presented by California Closets, we're talking to Dr. Michael Keeler out of the Workland School of Education, University of Calgary. He's a Canada Research Chair in Masculinity Studies. Um, we're grateful for our engaged live chat, uh, Doc. Uh, some of the smartest people in Canada gather together and people that aren't afraid of having big conversations. Steven says, ah, yes, the toxic masculinity topic. He says, just be a good human, period. You don't need to take down one segment of the population in order to lift up another. That is creating a divide in our society, in my opinion. That from Steven. Garth says, hey, hang on a second, though. Garth says what these world junior players, these hockey players are accused of doing uh, has nothing to do with masculinity. Uh, it's culture and norms uh, that happen to be uh, perpetrated, or, or, or maybe he means even perpetuated, by males. He says masculinity does not behave in those grotesque ways. Uh, what would you say to Stephen? What would you say to Garth? Um, yeah, I, I, I think they're both valid points. Um, and I'm not pitting, you know, um, it's men against women, masculine against feminine. Uh, I think that's a non-starter. If, if you just sort of put, put those two opposing sort of models out there, I think it's a non-starter for a conversation because you're actually not acknowledging um, how masculinities and femininities and gender operates in these spaces it is ultimately about power at the center of this and in terms of the second um email i i think that's a, again a very valid point because it is about sport culture and um it is um about the ways in which in these spaces like locker rooms um we promote certain ways of being athletes and certain models of athleticism uh which center on and i and i would suggest not to uh we don't need to say you can't be competitive but there are ways of being competitive and supportive and a team player that don't have to um sort of center around um belittling other players in the locker room or um, contributing to sort of this uh, conversation of conquests and sexualizing and uh, dominating. So again, I, I would probably agree with both of those emails a little differently. And I, I think it's not just about boys, it's about the culture that these boys and men walk into. And it is about, I think the second um, email talks about the expectations and attitudes well those expectations and attitudes about sporty boys and sporty men um need to shift and we need to rethink those because as we see in this um situation with the five hockey players this is not about one hockey player it's about a group so one hockey player had to have told another and why do we do that why do we share and try to um prove our masculinity because we want the kind of currency we want the kind of um validation that that gives us when we tell our other mates we want to be reassured of our position within that culture and and that culture oftentimes does um, become a very masculinized culture. 
Uh, you know, for, for people that are maybe not paying attention to the news cycle as, as diligently, I'll let them know it's not just this story uh, from, you know, the allegations stemming from 2018 and the London police uh, resuming an investigation after uh, a civil trial was settled uh, by Hockey Canada. People may or may not know that within the last week, uh, a former Quebec junior hockey player, uh, the son of a high profile former National Hockey League player, Shane Corson, uh, his son Noah found guilty of sexual assault. This for an incident back when he was uh, playing in the queue. Uh, he was 18 years of age. Uh, the victim here, 15 years of age. Another uh, situation involving uh, Corson and two teammates. Uh, the, the main issue here is that s- somebody in Canada under the age of 16 who cannot consent to group sex. There it is again, three hockey players in this situation and uh, Noah Corson convicted. Take us into your piece. Uh, this is at theconversation.com. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes so people can uh, go directly to it. From This is from October of, of 2022. So you wrote this uh, right as this story was, was breaking or at least onto the public's radar hockey Canada scandal highlights toxic masculinity in sports you know uh, and I don't want to attribute an attitude to Stephen in the live chat there but he goes ah here we go the toxic masculinity some people don't even some people the phrase even drives them nuts but but take us into this what, what do we learn from this situation and what about it in particular prompted you to write that piece well um again again I actually don't use the term toxic masculinity I think it's mm. uh, even though it, it is part of that headline there, um, it actually limits, I think, our understandings about boys and men. Uh, you know, it relies on this notion that all men are toxic. That's not the case. Um, it's it's the culture and it's the spaces that we enter into um, that has um, toxic elements to it in terms of attitudes and behaviors. And it's it's when we go into those spaces, we either adopt those um, kinds of attitudes and we adopt them and and we um, adhere to those rules because we know. Um, as um, athletes, as boys going into locker rooms, we know the consequences for not behaving like the rest of the boys. We know how we will get pushed to the fringes and become the uh, butt of ridicule. And so it is, again, about power in those spaces. It's about um, some boys um, trying to express sort of their position of privilege over other boys. And so, you know, again, when you think about, you know, why did I write this piece? Um, It's to acknowledge sort of the ways that we all um, participate in these spaces, and we are aware of um, the kind of behaviors and attitudes that get tossed around. And we can dismiss those jokes as just jokes. But when you are um, when you participate in locker rooms, uh, whether it's you know basketball, to choose a sport, um, and you hear the kind of um, banter that that you know is homophobic or um misogynistic sort of thing and you hear it repeatedly then you also start to um you also start to accept those behaviors as the way you need to be in order to be part of the club and part of the boys club and and that is not just in sporty spaces. We find that in the workplace as well. Uh, we realize that we need to talk about certain subjects to prove that we're just one of the boys. And to do otherwise, to to shift the conversation to other topics that aren't maybe traditionally masculine, you know, um, may raise questions about your sexuality, about your, you know, are you one of the boys or are you not? And it's it's usually put as either or. Are you with us or are you against us? And, you know, unfortunately, what this contributes to is also a whisper culture and um, in which we are aware of um, who's done what to whom within those locker room spaces. And um, what we need to do is step back and and realize that we're contributing to and maintaining certain uh, ways of being men in those spaces that 
can have damaging and damning effects uh, in long term. And as we can see here in um, this situation with the hockey players, is that it's not just one man, it's a group. And it's, it's about sharing um, and showing how masculine and how dominant we are. I'm grateful for this comment in our live chat from Alberta Girl, who says uh, our rural veterinarian at the clinic uh, told us that they're, they're large animal clients. Uh, you know, they had a hard time keeping women employed to work with large animals because of the way that their male clients, um, I'm, I'm assuming farmers, ranchers, uh, how they treated the women in the field. Alberta, uh, Alberta Girl says this is systemic. It's not limited to just the locker room. And, and I guarantee, obviously, people would say the exact same attitudes uh, persist in boardrooms and in many other circumstances. Is, is sports alone on an island in any context, or are we just talking about masculinity in sport because of this high-profile criminal trial that's about to go? Yeah, I, again, I, I probably agree with the uh, the email is that this is a systemic problem. This is a North American cultural understanding of masculinity, about how um, manliness and being a man um, is expressed in our day to day. And I mean, if you go back to your um, earlier example of the two boys coming in after, you know, playing in the mud. I mean, that's that's the everyday sort of expression. Um, in some ways, that's just play. And, and we can promote and encourage play among youth. Um, when we sort of chalk it up to, well, only boys play like that, then we are actually, again, limiting, um, you know, other children who also want to play. And, you know, when I, I myself have a daughter, um, you know, at university age, and when she was young, I would encourage and promote her to, to be active and to do a variety of activities. Um, to allow her to express herself in a, in a whole range of ways. And oftentimes she was mistaken as that boy up the tree because uh, both of the colors of her clothing and the very fact that we, she was so active and athletic. So all those kinds of expect, expectations and attitudes about the masculine and the feminine sort of play themselves out, I think, in the daily spaces, just as, you know, the last illustration is in the workspace. And, mm -hmm. and people come in expecting, can women really handle these large animals? Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Like how, how attitudes are changing in some circumstances and some not. I've, I've got friends that refer to blue jobs and pink jobs in the household. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've got friends that, that obviously, you know, some of them take issue. You know, I mean, like you look at like the big bookstore chains. I, I should mention, you know, a lot of people will hear this interview, you know, weeks or even months after you and I speak. But I think it, it's potentially relevant that you and I are talking on Valentine's Day. Uh, I'm sure that we can find an angle on that. But I, but I can think of high profile profile bookstores uh, that have got found themselves in hot water in past when they do the the gifts for her section and the gifts for him section and the gifts for her section is all like home improvement and self-improvement and beauty and the gifts for him are like you know how to learn woodworking and and, and like <laughs> just sort of like dumbed down other content and it, it seems like attitudes around that are changing uh, you reference something that's seems small but is not small which could be the color of clothing that people are willing to let their kids wear that their kids might wear to school um has parenting do you think changed quite a bit like what would you say to the parent right now that goes gosh we love the sport of hockey we grew up playing but we don't want to you know expose our kids or immerse our kids into a culture that's problematic what do you say to those parents i um so i think first and foremost um, I think ideas of parenting are changing. And when I say ideas of parenting, um, I'm thinking more of who's parenting, uh, which partner is, um, you know, primarily responsible for um, children and 
you know, domestic kind of things. And I think there's an increasing sort of um, more of a sharing of responsibilities and no one is better than the other. And so, again, in those cases, I think the attitudes around parenting and um, how you um, share the chores and the responsibilities of, of family in that case, I think, are changing and and there's there's positive i think signs in terms of who rears the children and who does the different kinds of chores around the house so so that's all to the positive um that's not to say that that's common in all households either i mean there are very traditional notions of what one partner does and what the other does and um and again those are just um routine everyday examples of what children see as normal um and what children you know think is the only way to be and and so again when you think about in um, schools what we're trying to do is um, promote a greater understanding more um, diverse understanding of um, how we conduct ourselves how we express ourselves and because i mean with growing research we've also understood that um, it isn't natural that uh, boys, for example, are aggressive and um, need to always um, show their dominance over others by um, fighting or by suppressing emotion. And, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the whole notion of femininity and feminine, we've also understood that girls and women aren't naturally just frail and and passive and um, not able to, you know, be politically um, uh, savvy sort of thing. So again, it's, it's all about sort of these shifting ideas about um, what our expectations are, what are our attitudes, and how do those get played out in the day to day. Um, I, I'm going to rattle off a ton of, of comments from the live chat after we say goodbye to you, doctor, because there, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in there. And, and some of the comments, I kind of go, what the, f-? but, but they're interesting and, 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 and they're enlightening that they, they bring us into people's perspectives. And then, and some of them I think are bang on as well. And, and I appreciate everything that, that the people are putting on our radar to help us understand where people are coming from. I like this one though, from Elias, who says, I'd like to hear the doctor's thoughts on the role of coaches out there. Uh, and why don't we include teachers and why don't we include managers and why don't we include people in positions of leadership a great point from Elias who says um, you know the role of coaches to go beyond the game to set and model overall behavior they spend so much time with these kids what's your message to coaches it's, uh, again a really good point and um, that's I think what I was saying earlier is boys and men enter these spaces and it is about how um, coaches uh, and and you know parents uh, perpetuate or maintain you know what do we expect how do we expect you to play how do we expect you to be a team member and how can we um, encourage you know more honesty um, no need to prove that you're better than um, the the person next to you in fact we are a team and we work together so. Um, I agree that, I mean, coaches are pivotal in um, sport culture in terms of informing and uh, promoting or encouraging players to, to see that they don't need to um, put down the person next to them because they feel threatened by their athleticism. They can actually um, encourage and hold up their their peers um, who who play just as well, if not better than them, but it doesn't need to be uh, putting them down so you can uh, put yourself up. It's always at the expense of someone else when you have that kind of culture that coaches need to rethink what they're actually trying to promote among the players. 
Interesting comment here from Carrie in our live chat who says this doctor is not basing uh, their research is not based on knowledge from a woman's perspective. Um, can, can you take us into your research? I, I, I might make the argument, but I'm just a pleb. I'm just a common, you know, whatever. What do people care about what I think about what you do? But I think it's probably important to have a man participating in the conversation about masculinity. But but I digress. What would you say to Carrie and, and maybe give us some insight into your research and who you talk to and how it happens? Yeah. Um, so again, I, I think um, you know, fair fair comment. Uh, it, it's not based on women, um, and the research does center on um, it. We focus on talking with boys, talking with men, um, and really sort of um, getting boys and men to speak to us about their experiences. And you only do that in spaces where you develop. Um, a sense of um, respect for each other and um, trust for each other in, in the research domain where boys and men feel that they're able to tell you things that they may not necessarily tell others. And in this case, the research I've been doing over the past 20 odd years, um, you know, oftentimes I will speak with adolescent boys who yearn to to tell me about their experiences they they are desperate to be heard and even that in itself pushes back on um, our assumptions about boys don't want to talk or boys um, are afraid to be vulnerable um, you know our research shows that um, boys in fact want to be heard and and they are looking for someone that they can confide in that's not going to necessarily judge them and um, definitely won't uh, think any less of them as a boy or as a man and and so the research context provides that setting um, and again you know the recent research we've done around uh, adolescent boys and we did talk with parents um, about the um, experiences during um, during the uh, sort of pandemic and how boys sort of navigated home spaces as well as how parents understood those boys and their experiences and you know what did come out in those cases was this um deep sadness and loneliness um among adolescent boys and and also parents um uncertainty about how do i support uh, my son when he's at home because he doesn't have his um, boy uh, friendship group um, that he once had at school. So that's when they're in and out of school sort of thing. So I hope I'm answering the question. And, um, you know, to, to the um, comment, um, I mean, spot on. Uh, there, there aren't women at, that are in my research team. There are women who do masculinities research and who are engaging in very similar research to what I'm doing. So it's it's just my research team uh, doesn't uh, currently have any women on. Uh, my, one of my um, graduate students has moved on and she does other research. Yeah. Um, in closing, I'd be curious about your insight. I want to I want to infuse a pop culture reference in, in my mind. One of the more significant uh, television shows of all time, uh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And I see it as kind of a bridge builder. Uh, it was a very popular show. Um, I, I know for a lot of the viewership, the viewership may have been female. Uh, but I also happen to know, even within my own friend circle, that it was a show that guys would watch with their girlfriends, guys would watch with their wives. And you're absolutely right. Anybody who denies that homophobia is part of locker room culture would only be lying to themselves. Uh, we hear the phrases. We hear the jokes. We know that. I think a lot of it is rooted in insecurity. I think a lot of it is rooted in uh, a lack of understanding. Um, but the fact remains uh, that it is pervasive. Uh, homophobia casual or otherwise. Uh, how do you perceive the significance of a show like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and others? Uh, well, um, again, another really good example. And I, I think if you sort of go from TV to the internet and you think about Andrew Tate, who is a misogynist, a social influencer, we can see how pervasive 
these attitudes are and how they can um, sort of permeate our every day. And, you know, I, I've spoken in high schools, I've spoken, you know, to adolescents and, um, you know, all youth, and, and they've expressed back to me about how um, they feel threatened by some of these images, right? So uh, specifically, I'm thinking of here, Andrew Tate. Um, but when you think about Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, I mean, that actually can um, be a springboard for conversations. I think you also point to the fact that, you know, homophobia, transphobia, I mean, it oftentimes occurs when uh, someone feels threatened about their own sense of well-being about their own uh you know gender identities and uh rather than feel um threatened you know within our culture we actually need to acknowledge so this diversity and um and consider how how might we just um respect others and um be more inclusive rather than be so defensive um that we need to protect our territory, and we need to assert ourselves as um, dominant. And, and uh, you know, again, it goes back to, I think, what we started about. I mean, it's ultimately about the power to, to be and to prove yourself as uh, oftentimes heteronormative, uh, to, to be that heterosexualized man that um, historically has maintained power. And, and there is there is a sense that, uh, you know, men are under siege or under threat sort of thing. And I would suggest that we need to be very careful about uh, what the fear is um, that some men feel like they're losing and, and, and reconsider um, that and reframe it to what are we gaining when we actually allow ourselves to be unlike the rest of the boys, how can we actually um, create healthier relationships um, because we don't feel limited or restricted by those very um, narrow uh, images of masculinity? Uh, we've been speaking with Dr. Michael Keeler, uh, who's a research chair of masculinity studies out of the University of Calgary, the Workland School of Education there. He recently spoke at the Petro-Canada Sport Leadership Conference, uh, where he addressed the power to speak, allyship, advocacy, and change. You can follow him on Twitter, at Dr. Michael Keeler. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for making us think. We appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Really great conversation. You got it, Doc. Keep in touch. And let us, Real Talkers, know what you think about what you just heard. I want to get to some of the comments here uh, in just a little bit. We've got some great comments. I loved uh, Heidi's contribution here, telling us what her husband does. Uh, he's a teacher, uh, an elementary phys ed teacher. And I'm going to tell you what he does every spring as soon as they get into sandal season. That coming up in just a second. And, and then we're going to uh, get on to our other feature today, which is completely different. We're talking biodiversity. Uh, hey, biodiversity. Maybe that is a hook. Maybe that is a common theme but i but i'm not an anthropologist a biologist or otherwise so i'll steer clear of that what i will let you know is that as we mentioned today is valentine's day and so if you happen to be listening to or watching this episode the day that we're doing it and you're in a bit of a jam you don't have a plan uh, either for your special someone or for your family or for your friends uh, friesen brothers knows that the love of really great food connects everybody this valentine's day treat your significant other friends or family with delightful specials like handcrafted chocolate dipped strawberries shortbread strawberry croissants even a meat freezer pack who doesn't love that for valentine's day plus all the special valentine's bouquets everything else you need to create an unforgettable day you'll look like you've been planning it for weeks check out friesen.com slash valentine's or visit them in store 16 locations across alberta friesen brothers is proudly alberta grown and Alberta owned. If you're looking to drop a bombshell gift on Valentine's Day, how about a custom closet? I mean, if you're sick of messing around or you've got some damage control to do, maybe you just really want to send a strong message to that special person. Or maybe you just want to invest in something that really ultimately is going to benefit you too. California Closets is the solution on this Valentine's Day. What a surprise. 
For that somebody in your life that's been trying to get organized, but you know without that proper infrastructure, without those custom closets and organizational systems, man, it's an uphill climb, isn't it? It all starts with a free consultation. Their design team takes over working with your ideas, your budget, infusing their expertise. The next thing you know, you've got a beautiful solution to storage, whether that's a custom closet or otherwise, you can start that conversation today at californiaclosets.ca. Hey, maybe you want to go big outside. Maybe you'd like to give your special somebody a promise. Maybe you want to write that note, that letter that lets them know that that outdoor kitchen is going to be installed this summer. Maybe you want to let them know that that trickling pond, that water feature they've always dreamed of, will be under construction this spring because you have already started the conversation with Eden Landscaping. For more than a quarter century, they've been experts in bringing outdoor spaces to life, custom landscape builds with over 20 years of experience, as we said, in Edmonton and area. One of the things that comes with that expertise is return business and referrals. And there's no better testimony than that. Plus, they're experts in the changing and evolving designs relating to climate, drought, and otherwise. As the world changes, so should landscape design. You can read more about the Eden Landscaping philosophy by visiting landscapeedmonton.ca. And if all this talk of reinvention, if, if all this talk of learning more and seeking to understand is lighting a fire under you, but post-secondary has never really been an option for you because of all those barriers. You can't commute to school. You can't adhere to a specific schedule. Maybe you're working. Maybe you got other things on the go. Check out Athabasca University, won't you? It's Canada's open university. World-class accredited online degrees and courses designed so you can complete your education wherever and whenever it works for you. They've got a transfer credit program. They've got financial aid and awards available. You can get that journey started today. Learn more about admissions, maybe future student information. Maybe that's your thing, planning a year out. You'll find everything online at athabascau.ca. Shout out to Garth for his $5 contribution in our super chat. We sure appreciate that. He says inclusivity will bring in various cultures from various countries. Uh, Garth goes on to suggest it. It's not maybe 100% on topic, Garth, but I'm working with you here because uh, I remember Garth sent me a very memorable email just yesterday, and I've got it locked and loaded for Friday uh, as we recognize uh, Black History Month in our Real Talk Roundtable coming up. Uh, Garth says, you know, people get shamed for suggesting folks assimilate into Canadian culture. We'll expand on that. Garth, don't you worry when we read your email on Friday. Love this from Heidi in the live chat. Says, my husband is an elementary phys ed teacher. He makes sure that his toenails are painted in the summer uh, to show kids that you can be more than one thing there you I go i think that's great yeah i love that yeah. um you know the conversations around masculinity i know prompt different thoughts uh with different people they'll land differently based on your perspective your experience and again we want to welcome your thoughts and your feedback to talk at ryan maybe it's a contribution uh, if there's a little oomph behind it for the flamethrower, which wraps up every Friday episode for us. Uh, of course, that's your chance to get whatever you need, your hot takes off your chest, presented by our wonderful friends at the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Hey, there's a very cool thing uh, going on this weekend, and it's presented by, sponsored by, every single year, uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada. It's, it's a way for researchers, scientists, and then, of course, the general public to better understand how we're doing in maintaining biodiversity, and in particular, with bird populations in both rural and urban areas. And uh, it's a very cool opportunity that we've got right now to check in with Sean Fagan, who's the uh, communications media coordinator uh, for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Before joining NCC, Sean actually worked as a biologist across Western Canada uh, for a number of years before pursuing a career in journalism and storytelling. Sean, it's wonderful to have you here on the show. Thanks for making time for us. Thanks so much, Ryan. Good to be here. Yeah. Wh wh why is it so important uh, to study bird populations? Why is it so important to rally, uh, if this year holds true to past years, thousands of participants into the great backyard bird count? Why does it matter? I think birds serve as the canary in the coal mine for our ecosystems. So knowing what their populations are doing can tell us a lot about the world. Uh, this is an awesome initiative. It's really easy to participate and it's global. Last year, 202 countries participated over uh, half a million people participated. Um, more and more people are getting out and enjoying birding. Uh, I think there's there's many 
reasons why that's uh, enjoyable for people. Um, so yeah, so uh, as I said, it's really easy to to participate. All it takes is 15 minutes spending some time in nature and uh, logging your bird sightings. Okay, but people are going to be listening to this or watching this and they're going to go, I don't know anything about birds. I mean, everybody knows the red-breasted robin, everybody knows the magpies, maybe the ravens, the blue jays. And then we get all confused around, was that a sparrow or a swallow? And we don't know. And, and so what would you say to these people that go, this sounds really neat and I'd love to participate, but I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, there's some great apps that can help you identify uh, species. And so, you know, I think this is a really beginner friendly event. Uh, picture there is an American Dipper. That's a bird that actually lives in our mountain streams. Really cool bird you can see. Um, this is like the, the Merlin app here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, with this app, you can actually identify birds with, uh, by song. So so if you hear a bird singing, you can, you can play this and it uses uh, AI algorithms to, to help you identify the species. Um, you can also identify via photos with this app. Um, and then there's also what's called a step-by-step -step guide. And so you basically put in where you uh, saw the bird, what it was doing, what color it was, and it'll help you uh, whittle that down into, uh, into what you saw. So yeah, really beginner friendly. Um, I'd say, you know, I think one really nice thing about birding is um, it's often a really social activity. Uh, we know that there's uh, sadly a bit of a loneliness epi epidemic out there. Um, and so there are, you know, various naturalist groups. Uh, so you could join other people and go out birding with them. Um, you know, it's Valentine's Day. I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't mention, uh, I know two people that uh, fell in love uh, birding together. Oh, and nice. uh, they, re they recently had a baby. So, um, you know, maybe that's your uh, one of your uh, viewers pathway to love who knows oh, hey i like i like how we're gonna sell that that's uh, that, that's a good thing what did they name the baby by the way do you know is there was there like a bird theme no i don't think any bird theme yet no okay. sorry but okay. uh, not robin or cardinal uh, as soon as you mentioned that merlin app a lot of people got really excited uh, including in our live chat people are saying i have that app it's great says 80s fanify um i've been lucky enough to, to marry into a family my father-in-law is like just incredible has a wealth of knowledge with birds fascinated by them and, and uh, they live in rural saskatchewan and he's got he basically operates as a hobby a bird sanctuary i mean the feeders and the i mean the, the water and like all the stuff he's created is just absolutely fascinating um he was the one that that let that 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 helped me identify a bird. There was a, there's a bird. Uh, we live in, in urban Edmonton. We're five minutes out of downtown. And there was just this, this beautiful, almost like sort of a piercing, but very interesting uh, bird call. I couldn't sort it out. And he helped me identify that we have, we have an American kestrel, uh, a, a very, a, a small falcon, um, that actually hunts and, and as, as best we can tell, lives somewhere near us, but just absolutely fascinating to watch. Uh, my young son and I have done reading and learned about the kestrel, uh, you know, based in large part because we were able to identify it. And that created kind of a fun exercise for us to participate in uh, together. Do you happen to know off the top of your head if, if uh, an American kestrel, if that's an unusual sighting in an urban center or is that like completely normal? I think they're around. Um, I think that they'll often hunt in open areas. They are migratory, so uh, you, you're unlikely to see them in this time of the year. Although I think one of the best um, winter birding uh, pathways is is just taking a uh, drive out into the country. There's lots of cool things you can see at this time of year. Um, things like snowy owls or uh, rough-legged hawk, uh, as well as a really cool species, uh, which is the jeer falcon, which is the largest falcon in the world. And uh, yeah, so these are all Arctic breeders that come down to lower uh, latitudes uh, in the winter time. So, so we can see them. I remember having a, a, a really discouraging conversation. It was fascinating, but it was discouraging a couple of years ago on this show, uh, with somebody, if I remember correctly, the expert was out of Chicago and they were talking about the, the millions and millions of bird deaths, uh, that occur in cities, uh, in particular skyscrapers, obviously windows are, are big culprits. And, and this expert, uh, helped us understand why this is such a huge issue. How are bird populations doing? Like, what does the data tell us after year, after year, after year of this great backyard bird count? I think that's one of the tough things with falling in love with birds is that you start to learn about how many of their populations are not doing well. Um, you know, I don't want to get anyone down on, on Valentine's Day here. I think the, the positive thing is that there's many things we can do to help our birds. 
And that goes from supporting conservation like that that the Nature Conservancy of Canada does, uh, participate in these various citizen science initiatives. Um, there's also things that we can do around the house. Um, yeah, as you said, uh, collisions is is this massive pr problem. And, you know, I think skyscrapers get uh, get a lot of the focus there because um, they're they're often lit up and uh, have reflective surfaces uh, and, and do cause a lot of mortality. But uh, bird, there's a lot of bird collisions that happen around the home as well. So um, there are ways to mitigate window strikes. Um, another huge source of mortality is uh, roaming cats. Uh, so, you know, if you are a cat owner, keep your cat indoors. Uh, I think that's that, that's beneficial to the birds, but also uh, your your pet as well. Uh, you know, our neighborhoods are full of bobcats and coyotes and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, and, and another thing people can do is uh, plant native species uh, around their around their garden, maybe plant some some native shrubs. Uh, you know, I think lo looking at uh, the the summer ahead uh, with the drought, um, you know, the the monoculture lawn might be on the way out. Um, so it's a great time to uh, plant some native species. And I think that's a great way to really get in touch with uh, our, our own natural heritage. Alberta has uh, incredible natural history. And uh, why not have some of that right in your own backyard? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, we talked to this. I mean, obviously, we, we go to the wall for our sponsors, but our friends at Eden Landscaping talk to us about that all the time, how more and more of their clients. Uh, there's the drought awareness, which is influencing landscape design, but then there's also people that are recognizing the importance of, like, drawing in pollinators and, and reintegrating the native plants and grasses to, 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 you know, indigenous certain areas and really fascinating stuff. Um, can, can I ask you about ravens? LJ in our live chat says, I absolutely love ravens. These are uh, the I go, I go down these YouTube rabbit holes watching ravens solve problems and figure things out and use tools to, to get food out of tight spots. And I mean, just a magnificent, magnificent bird, just this jet black survivor. Uh, we see him in high alpine areas. How, how, how does the raven land with you? No pun intended. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a big raven fan. You know, I think uh, when you look at a raven, you, you can see that intelligence looking back at you. I think that's that's what makes them really special. They are the largest uh, songbird in the world, so that's kind of interesting as well. Um, I think they have something like fi over 50 vocalizations, um, and they're also a really important part of your ecosystem, being uh, you know a consumer of carrion that sort of thing. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of importance there. Um, and yeah, it's hard not to like corvids, things like jays, uh, crows, that sort of thing, just for their their raw intelligence. So um, you know, I think. I think oftentimes we, we see things like ravens that, you know, maybe they're next to the garbage can at, uh, at, at you know, the parking lot in Banff or something like that, and you kind of overlook them. But, uh, you know, I, I think they're a great reminder that uh, birds are flying dinosaurs. They're basically kind of T-Rexes out there. And, uh, you know, I think kind of thinking about birds and their evolutionary history makes us think about our own uh, path on this planet and, uh, you know, that we're kind of flying through space on a rock, which is pretty bizarre. We know that, like, you know... There's, there's, uh, you know, the flying dinosaurs. I love you say that. Um, you know, people look at crocodiles, alligators. They're like they've been here millions of years. They were here long before us, and they'll be here long after us. Are, are we going to mess it up for birds, or are birds going to be here long after we mess it up for ourselves? You know, I think there's room for a lot of optimism here. Uh, how long have have people been doing conservation work? Maybe a hundred years, a bit, a bit longer, and uh, in that time. Uh, there's been challenges and there's been um, some sad stories, but uh, there's also been some great successes. Uh, things like, uh, you know, a lot of our raptors declined around uh, kind of the mid 20th century due to um, the use of DDT. Uh, we ad identified that problem, addressed it. And, uh, you know, many, many of these species, things like bald eagle, peregrine falcon um, are coming back. Uh, NCC has an office downtown uh, Edmonton and uh yeah, I was there and it was pretty cool. Like there was a peregrine falcon flying around, basically just demolishing pigeons all day. So it was hard getting any work done that day. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think there is a lot of room for hope. I think we all kind of do a, a little bit, uh, can go a long way. And um, yeah, I think I think one of the most important things is just ex experience, uh, you know, the the magic that is birds. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of fascinating things. Think about our migrant birds, um, you know. In a couple months, you'll be able to see shorebirds that uh, spent their time uh, in southern South America, or if not Antarctica, and that were are going to fly all the way to um, the Arctic. So, 
you know, I think it's just, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're fantastic. And there's a lot of reasons why, why people are so drawn to them. Wise Kyle's in our chat. Uh, happen to know he lives in Edmonton. He says he's seen bald eagles in the trees near his house. I saw a bald eagle last summer uh, in what I thought was a very unlikely spot. Uh, the more I dug into it and asked around, it turned out that it's not that unusual, actually, to see a bald eagle uh, in the city of Edmonton. People will hear this from across the country, but a lot of them will be listening from Western Canada and Alberta in particular. What are what are some species, maybe in addition to the bald eagle, that people might be surprised to see, but there's a good chance they'll see them this Family Day weekend? Uh, yeah, there's some there's some good uh, good options there. I think uh, so. The winter time, uh, kind of in the birding community, is known as weird duck time. Uh, and so, any place there's open water, you get a chance that there's going to be uh, waterfowl overwintering there. Um, so you can get things like long-tailed duck. It's a really cool-looking duck. Uh, there's also harlequin duck that breed on our coasts. Um, they, they will uh, overwinter here in small numbers, uh, but you can see them. I know there's a couple on the Bow River right now. Um, and kind of looking back at, uh, you know, to your previous question about uh, conservation successes, another is our waterfall populations. Um, in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, a lot of our po uh, duck populations were in severe decline. And so there was an initiative between Canada, the U.S. and later Mexico to create what's called the North America, North American Waterfowl Partnership or Management Partnership. And so this is an effort that has targeted wetland restoration, wetland conservation. And as a result, many of our um, ducks have, have recovered quite nicely. And uh, there's also the added benefits that wetlands do a lot for people. Um, they help mitigate floods, they help store uh, water, which can mitigate um, drought. So, um, you know, I think, again, kind of thinking about our, our situation in Alberta with the drought, um, you know, conservation is is going to be a, a huge factor in 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 dealing with that problem into the future. Mm, unbelievable stuff. I'm I'm uh, as we're talking, uh, just calling up videos. Johnny's doing a great job as well. People will be listening to this on the podcast. They should watch the YouTube episode for this to see some of these just magnificent animals. Um, and and I love some of the stories we're hearing from people as well talking about the, the geese flying by. There's nothing I mentioned our, the the family farm uh, on my wife's side. Uh, in Saskatchewan, outside Humboldt, at the right time of year, typically it's around Thanksgiving, you'll see these flocks. I don't know what the right word is for them, but snow geese, like, I, I want to say by the millions. I mean, let me say by, like, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. It's like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, it's just absolutely remarkable. There's, there's just such majestic creatures you know people are writing in talking about gray partridges and, and and hungarian partridges i've never even heard of that uh people are talking about they they have turkey vultures that pair up near their homes i mean this is amazing stuff it's 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 it, you gotta love when i can see the smile smeared across your face when <laughs> when people get excited about stuff like this ultimately what it's doing is it's reaffirming to us and reiterating the importance of conservation right i mean that's what it's all about yeah, for sure. I think it's all about experiencing these amazing things that are in our literal and figurative backyards. So why not act to help them? Um, that's a in picture. That's a towns in solitaire, a really cool bird um, that uh, kind of breed up in the foothills, but uh, will come down to our city parks in the winter. Uh, they're one of the few songbirds that sing throughout the winter, uh, and they do that to protect um, their their food grounds. So cool. Sean, before we thank you for your time, um, you sent us so uh, much material when it comes to like these videos and photos of these magnificent creatures. Is there a species of bird that people are likely to see or could see this weekend that we've not yet mentioned? I would hate for us to wrap our interview and you go, oh, my gosh, I forgot to talk about that bird. Is there one in closing that, that really you're fascinated by? Well, my favorite birds are songbirds um, and the group of songbirds that do stick around in the winter in pretty large numbers are our finches. And there's a lot of beautiful finches. Um, Pine grosbeak is an amazing bird. They're they're large, almost like a, a cardinal. They're this deep red. Uh, there's also evening grosbeak, which is another beautiful species. Uh, evening grosbeak, they have declined by something like over 90 percent since uh, 1970s. So um, getting out there and trying to see one, uh, you can create or 
uh, log really important data to to understand their declines better. Oh, very cool stuff. Um, it, we're we're seeing we're seeing some some good natured ribbing as well. There's there's the birds that aren't as popular. You know, you feel bad for these animals. Um, you know, pigeons. I mean, I like Mike Tyson loves his pigeons. You'll find no n- nobody loves pigeons more than Mike Tyson. Um, uh, in my neighborhood, people do not love them. Um, uh, they're oftentimes referred to as sky rats, and they can create a lot of problems and uh, you know that sort of a thing. The magpies get a bad rap. I actually quite like. Like magpies, uh, my grandpa Rudy, may he rest in peace, uh, may turn in his grave if he hears me say that I love magpies because he couldn't stand how the magpies would interfere with the robins who he loved in his, in his backyard. Uh, is there a bird that gets a bad rap in closing that, that you think deserves another chance in the public's eye? Well, I'd certainly say magpie. Um, you know, Calgary had the, uh, we, we had the competition to see what the, uh, the, the city bird would be and the the finalists were uh, black cap chickadee versus uh um yeah the black billed magpie and uh chickadee won i was team magpie all the way uh you know i think i think yes they're annoying they're they're no, they're noisy uh maybe you know they're kind of opportunistic so they might peck some bunnies to death here and there uh but uh you know just just take a look at them for you know, a few seconds. They're they're beautiful. They have this shiny blue iridescence, um, and then you know, there's that intelligence factor again. They're they're smart birds, and I think uh, we got to respect that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, people are. Yeah, uh, Kenzie's writing in here says uh, that magpies will chick uh, will chip out a calf's eye. Uh, so like, <laughs> hey man, this of uh, nature. Nature is unforgiving, isn't it? Real. Um, yeah, this is real. And and I love this is amazing. You know, a show like this, we're drawing audience members from all over the place, so people are seeing different different birds in their neck of the woods, which of course is the whole point of the great backyard bird count. Uh, you can learn more about it just by clicking on the link in the show notes. We'll punch it into our live chat as well uh, or you can check out birdscanada.org uh and of course we've been speaking uh it, it's been awesome to talk to you sean sean fian of course with the nature conservancy of canada you guys have um i would say appeared on this show two three times a year um sometimes it's about prairie grasslands sometimes it's about bird populations and we've got a lot of respect for the work you do we'll link to your website as well in our show notes Thank thanks for doing this and, and have fun I'll, i will commit to you a good number of moments uh we're going to be down at my folks house visiting this weekend, I don't know if this is cheating. I don't know if it'll return. I don't know if I'll see it this weekend. But the last time I was there, I was out in their backyard, standing there with my dog, just taking in the fresh air, South Calgary. And what did I hear and then ultimately see but a woodpecker going to work on one of their Swedish aspens? It was a really, really neat thing to see up close. Nice. Well, thanks so much and uh, happy birding. Thanks, buddy. Happy birding to you as well. Uh, Sean Fee in there from the Nature Conservancy of Canada. I am putting you on the spot, but you've had plenty of time okay. uh, to immerse yourself in this conversation. John Hicks, do you have a favorite bird? <laughs> I don't have a favorite bird, but uh, my partner, Jatinder, is is all about birding right now. She uh, went and got some high-quality bird bells and feeders, oh, and cool. now our backyard. I, I, I had no idea that you could literally create an ecosystem in your backyard. Totally. In just, in just a few short weeks, I mean, we've seen sparrows and and magpies and robins and and blue jays and woodpeckers. This was all just uh, you know in the fall and the spring, but uh, and now the squirrels are coming out, and I'm like, we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to chip in some money here and really start supporting this ecosystem we have in the backyard. But it, it's amazing because. Before we started doing that, you know, you rarely, you know, you see a bird. Oh, what's that? Yeah. But when they're right there and our pets as well get up in the window now and they just love and enjoy it. And it really is, like he said, it really is like relaxing. It can take away anxiety. It can improve your mental health. And I think that's what it's doing for my partner uh, in a major way. So I love it's, that. it's awesome. And, uh, you know, when you're younger, you used to make fun of older people going bird watching. And now I'm like. I get it now. Well, as it we takes your mind off of everything else and just gets you into like, hey, here's nature doing its thing. It doesn't yeah, need to know what it's supposed to do. Yeah. It just does it. And we, we didn't realize they were all getting stoned and going into the woods. We didn't realize <laughs> that. As you get older, you realize. Yeah. I thought somebody was pulling my leg in the chat until I did research. I, I'll admit, I want to. Hey, I want to learn something every day from this show, and I hope that that if you tune in daily, wherever you listen to it or watch it, we appreciate it. I hope you learn something every day. I thought somebody was pulling my leg when they put it in the chat that they had seen a Baltimore Oriole up near Fort McMurray. And I thought, well, like a player, like I thought that was like a player from the baseball team. (laughs) No, I'm embarrassed, but here we go. I just learned from you, our real talkers, that the Baltimore Oriole is actually a type of bird. 
I didn't know there's actually a bird. I'm showing it on my screen right now called the Baltimore Oriole. Well, yeah, Did you know that? Of course. It's I on just the thought, hat. Well, no, I know it's on the <laughs> yes. hat, but I didn't think that it was na- Is it named after? What was first, the bird or the baseball team? Had to be the bird. Had to be the bird first. Had to be the bird first. <laughs> anyway, sometimes the things we learn are profound and sometimes not as much. Uh, so thanks to those of you that put the Baltimore Oriole on my radar. Love this from Jordan, who says that he sees pileated woodpeckers. What is it like? This is honestly, you, we're not blowing smoke when we say you guys are the most informed, engaged talk audience in Canada. Listen, look at you guys go. I love this. Uh, Tony says uh, when she was in Palm Springs in January, saw a ton of hummingbirds. Says those little things are amazing. It's fascinating, isn't it? And by the way, shout out to, I think it was Sylvia or somebody in our chat let me know that that Humboldt, that area near our my wife's family farm, uh, is on a migratory path path which makes sense uh, why you'd see all those snow geese um and i hate to say it but that's also probably why there's so many people out hunting uh cleaning up out there but like it's unbelievable to see the the numbers the masses it's it's amazing but you go into these uh bird stores maybe that's where jatinder went um i love going in there and yeah. and and it, it it it's also very cool that my father-in-law makes custom bird houses oh, uh, so awesome. he does these yeah. like super cool bird houses oftentimes he'll do models of people's actual houses oh i love those where they can yeah. put the bird house out front yeah. and it models their actual house yeah. Uh, but you go into these places and they'll they'll educate you on if you're trying to draw in certain birds, you put out certain feed sure. or certain types yeah. of feeders. And, um, you know, you might be surprised to hear that in certain parts of urban centers here in Western Canada, you can draw in hummingbirds. It's not yeah. like it's not guaranteed. And and the, the the expert that I was talking to, she told me that like it could be the difference of a few blocks here or there. Somebody, mm-hmm. for example, in our home city of Edmonton, closer to the River Valley in this direction, may see hummingbirds, whereas somebody five blocks to ten blocks over this way would not see a hummingbird, yeah, despite strange, their right? their best yeah. efforts to attract them. Yeah. But but pretty neat how that. And when you do see one, wow. Yeah, one of my partner's f- all time favorite birds. She loves hummingbirds. I also love how the doctor referred to them as flying dinosaurs. I just love that that, that they are like so far back in the evolutionary chain that yeah. they were around then too i think well. travis is correcting me if i'm doing uh, if i'm reading this correctly he probably. says he says yeah probably i mean you know who isn't correcting me these days but he's he says uh, no, no no he says uh it was at athabasca I saw a baltimore oriole and Ath- shout out to athabasca this morning uh we're gonna go out to jasper in just a quick second because i want to tell you what's going on out there for family day weekend but before we do that uh just a quick note for those of you i know some of you are watching this show live uh you usually catch it later but you're watching live because you're you're actually looking for employment right now. You're not working right now as, as much as you would like to anyway. And that's why I want to put Kubi Energy on your radar. You go, what do I know about electricity? What do I know about solar power? doesn't matter. If you know anything about sales, if you know anything about office administration, if you know about HR... And it doesn't hurt if you're an experienced solar installer or an electrician, uh, maybe an apprentice. Kubi is literally always hiring. (laughs) You can check out the careers link for more information on what it looks like to join their team and help them grow clean energy in Canada. I told you the story of when the CEO, the founding CEO of Kubi Energy was out in Kamloops at their field office there. And and Jake says to me, one of their new hires, turns out it's one of their best installers, came up to him in Kamloops and said, I am here because I heard you were hiring on Real Talk. How cool is that? So shout out to our BC audience and to that new Kubi team member, that's working out of their Kamloops office. Congratulations to you on the new gig. Again, kubienergy.ca, the careers link, if you're looking to help grow clean energy in Canada. We also wanted to mention to you that our friends at Complete Care Restoration, around the clock, 24 hours a day, are ready to take your call in case of emergency. They're the only sponsor of ours that hopes you never call them. However, if disaster strikes, burst pipe, water leak, flooding, fire, You've just found black mold or asbestos. Do not do that yourself. Uh, got, look at this, John. I've got a phone call coming in as I'm showing my screen. I'm going to have to give somebody hell after the show. Who doesn't know we're live at 947 in the morning? Complete Care Restoration has more than 25 years of experience restoring your property, rebuilding your peace of mind. It's what they do with their talented team of trained professionals. You'll find them online at Complete Care Restoration. Ca. And speaking of hiring right now, same goes with our friends at Apex Automation. They're looking for recruiting and hiring the most talented engineers 
in Canada. As a matter of fact, they're going international as well. Last time I was at their head office for a visit, they had brought in three or four very skilled engineers from China, new Canadians that were taking advantage of Apex's growth in the space. They're automating in the energy industry, in particular upstream oil extraction, pipelines, natural gas processing, chemical manufacturing, shout out to Saskatoon and Vancouver, potash mining in Saskatchewan, robotics, and more. This is a team. This is a firm that is on the cutting edge of where industry is going. And they pride themselves on the relationships that they have with their clients. You can learn more about Apex Automation by visiting apexautomation.ca. Every Wednesday, we have a chance to get out to the mountains, uh, courtesy of our friends at Tourism Jasper. And this week, as we present My Jasper Memories in partnership with Tourism Jasper, we want to make sure that Marmot Basin's on your radar. You know, a lot of people are going to be looking for cool things to do over the family day weekend. It's upon us. And as you know, of course, there's a lot to do in Jasper with your little ones, uh, including ice walking in the Moline Canyon, sleigh rides on Pyramid Lake in particular, so magical. Skating on Lake Mildred at the Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge and so much more. But for groups who are looking to shred the slopes, Marmot Basin has new snow this week and a hot deal special for families. The Marmot Basin Family Pass has landed just in time for Family Day weekend. That's two adults and two children aged 17 and under can pick up that family pass it's a package of four one-day lift tickets for under three hundred dollars that's 298 dollars it's a fantastic deal that's available only online but here's the deal i'm going to tell you a secret you can cash in on it all season long not just this family day weekend but it's a perfect timing you can also of course purchase additional lift tickets uh, online or at ticket windows if your family exceeds four uh, Marmot Basin's also got a lot of options for child care, for kids, ski and snowboard lessons. Our Wyatt has loved learning to ride at Marmot Basin. And if the kids don't feel like skiing, My Jasper Nanny is currently offering 10% off child care so you can ski at your own pace while your kids have their own adventure. You can find more information online directly at skimarmot.com. And when you make your Jasper memories this Family Day weekend, we would love to see them. You can post on Instagram or Twitter using the hashtags MyJasper and RealTalkRJ. And there's a very good chance that you're going to see your Jasper memories featured right here on Real Talk, presented every Wednesday by our friends at Tourism Jasper. You going to take it easy this weekend? I don't know yet. What are you? What are you gonna get well, up to? Well, yeah, we're we're just gonna we're we're actually gonna sort of like take the long weekend to do uh, how I believe or to recognize it how I believe it was intended With to the be family. recognized. Yeah, you remember? Yeah. Do you remember this? This is uh, the Family Day weekend. Kind of has an interesting history in the province of Alberta. Yeah. Um, Don Getty, former premier, uh, his son found himself in some trouble. Um, you know, relating to you know, how do I put it? Basically, his drug use and um, and and the premier. Um, at the time, I think uh, it, was a, it was a prominent story uh, that was in front of the general population. And I think that the premier's way of responding to that was to make a commitment uh, to families, to make it possible for more families to spend more time together. And that was how Family Day was born. Wow, in I didn't know that. Yeah, I See? remember reading about that. So You learned about the Oriole. I learned about Family Day yeah, today. The Baltimore <laughs> Oriole, Family Day. <laughs> yeah. uh, I saw somebody in our chat say that this entire episode today has been about weird ducks, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> Funny and interesting, but um, yeah, so we're just going to kind of take our time and uh, time together and, and reflect and relax. And nice. it, it, it feels like this like shoulder season. I don't know if you guys are feeling the same way, but we're definitely not out of winter yet. No. Um, and we're not definitely into spring. It's that yet, but weird it kinda, part. Yeah, that yeah. kind of part where you can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I can't wait. And, and soon the snow will be <laughs> melting and those trees will be budding and maybe some of the different birds will start to arrive. And again. you'll be teeing off. We'll be teeing off. <laughs> Oh, buddy, can't wait. <laughs> yeah, we'll be talking about the Real Talk Golf Classic, won't we? That's exciting. Yep. Mark your calendars for Thursday, uh, June 20th. I wanted to let you know what's coming up for the remainder of the week here on Real Talk as we thank you for checking out this episode and remind you how much it means to us when you hit like if you're watching on YouTube, when you share this episode with somebody in your life that you think might benefit from that conversation about masculinity and sport or, heck, birding. It's easy to do. Tomorrow's episode, that'll be February 15th. 
Thursday. We'll sit down with, she's got to be one of the leading candidates for leadership of the Alberta NDP, Sarah Hoffman, former Deputy Premier, former Health Minister. And then on Friday, a Real Talk roundtable you won't want to miss with two very special guests as Real Talk recognizes Black History Month. We'll see you soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, 